I'm going to be talking about a product I've developed. And I want to talk about how my life stories have led me to get to that point. So this is a photo of me in a tent in Dorset on holiday, being completely immersed in, in a game. And I've been a gamer all of my life, and this idea around immersion has always fascinated me. Being completely focused, the, it brings on almost a zen-like state that psychologi psychologists call flow. And it's this idea that made me want to, to make my own games. And so a number of years later, I did a master's degree in game design, where I learned everything there was to know about making games. I learned about coding, I learned about animation and 3D modeling. And I came out of university all hum uh, pumped up, thinking I was going to get a job, but I hit a brick wall. It was very difficult to get a job because I didn't have quite enough skills. But I was fortunate enough to get a job in publishing. And this was selling games. And I learned everything there was to know about selling games to different markets because people in Japan have very different tastes to, say, people in Germany. And I did this for a number of years, and I did some really cool stuff, like designing covers for games. And this is actually a friend of mine in a tunnel just down the road from here, pretending that he's got out his wits uh, in an Antarctic horror game. And I did this for a few years, and, um, but I, I was stu still drawn back to making games. And so I quit that job, and I found a job working for a games development company as a community manager. I wasn't quite making games, but I was getting there. And I was working on this project that was to try and engage people with dance. And it was, it was called Dance Tag. And my role was to engage the audience, to talk to the audience, to get some feedback, to so we could make the game better. And it was, it was very difficult. Getting people to dance in public was, uh, was r remarkably hard. But um, I learned some really valuable skills. And this was three days a week. And so I had a couple of days spare. And I decided to do something that I'd always wanted to do, which was furniture making. And I started um, the course, and they, they um, suggested we come up with a design for our own piece of furniture. And I came up with an idea of a chair that was based on a weeble. For those that don't know what a weeble is, a weeble is a self-writing um, egg-shaped toy that's heavier in, heavier in the base and lighter in the top. And I made a 3D model from the skills that I learnt during my um, MA, and I cut this egg shape into 17 concentric circles and glued them together, sanded it down, and this is, this is what I came, came up with. And it worked as a chair, and it helped with posture, and it was comfortable, but I didn't really see a business opportunity there. And I couldn't really sort of see myself making this. It, it took a lot of time. It was quite expensive to make. So I, I, so I left it for a while. And I was looking for my next challenge. And that was to do a course in design. I still wanted to make games. And, but, but by this point, I was looking at games that were street games, so sort of real life games. And I got an interview. It was here at UWE. And something interested, interesting happened during the interview. They said, this master's degree is, is quite um, focused on objects. And you want to make apps. Um, so I was, I was thinking, well, OK, right. What, what have I got? And my chair came into my head. And I, and I showed them a picture of my chair on my phone. And they got quite excited. That, and they said, have you thought about using your chair with games and your knowledge of game design. And I went home that night and I thought, OK, I'm going to try and get the sensors, the motion sensors that 
in, that are in uh, most smartphones nowadays connected to my computer. And I got it up and running. And I was thinking, OK, this is a really interesting idea. What can I do with it? What applications could a, a, an input device like this be used for? And I was thinking it could be used to control drones, or it could be used for rehabilitation. Um, but the thing that obviously made a lot of sense was games. And so at this point, I brought in uh, some friends of mine who were game developers, and we got it running within games. And it was surprisingly good and easy to use and intuitive. But again, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do with it. Who was going to buy a big egg chair to play games on? It was a bit of a sort of luxury, strange peripheral. So again, I left it for a while. And this is a couple of years ago. And around about the same time, there's this whole new area of gaming that had gained a lot of interest in the media. And this was virtual reality. VR has been around since the 60s. It was used in military applications. But for the first time ever, it, it, uh, the, the components were uh, affordable enough to to be um, affordable for most consumers. And there was a company that, was, uh, that came out of California called Oculus that started this, this new revolution in, uh, in, in VR. And so I was aware of this, and I was excited by it. And I was thinking, OK, maybe I could use my chair within VR. And so fairly quickly, I got it up and running within VR, and I found it was incredibly intuitive. It was very easy to use. It felt very natural. You just leant on the chair, and your, your avatar started walking forward. And if you turned in the virtual space, you turned, and it just felt, felt very, very normal. And it was, it was a problem. Movement in VR was a problem that I didn't actually know existed. How do you walk along a beach and don't walk into your sofa? How do you run around a first-person shooter without running into your French doors. It was this big problem. And th there, there, are, there are products in the market. There, there's things that you strap yourself into and um, simulate walking. But they're big pieces of equipment. Or there's um, joy pads. But that can cause something called simulation sickness. When your brain gets confused by what it sees, it doesn't correlate with what your body's actually doing. So at this point, I knew I had a product. And I expanded my team. I got funding. And I found a place to work from, which is the Pervasive Media Studio here in Bristol, which is an incredible space for technologists and artists. And what I want to do now is to give you a demonstration of the chair, a live demonstration. So this is a little bit risky. But uh, just bear with me. OK, so I'm going to put the headset on. What you see over there is what I'm seeing. So if I tilt forward on the chair, I start walking forward. It's completely hands-free, so that means I can bring my hands into the virtual space if I want to. And it's very easy to use. So if you lean left or right, I think I might just stay in here for a while. <laughs> okay, so so that was um, so that was about a year ago, and since then I've taken the product around the world, and I've um, got some funding through a crowdfunding. Um, we've, we've started manufacturing it, and we've, we've got, um, we've got moulds made for a fiberglass version, which is the version that you see up here. And it's, um, yeah, we've done really well. But the most important thing that I feel is an accomplishment is the fact that I've been able to engage people with immersion. I've been able to get people more deeply immersed in the game. And that was the thing that I'd always wanted to do since I was a child. 
And the thing was, I didn't know all of those points in my life had would, would, would lead to this. So when I did the furniture making course, I didn't realize I would learn the skills to, to make this object. When I did the community manage management job, I didn't know that I would learn how to speak to my audience and to learn to design through iteration. And when I was publishing, I didn't know that I'd be learning the skills to sell to different markets, such as Japan and the States. And, and so it's that, it's that passion that has driven me to innovate. Thank you.